I'm very pleased to welcome Julian Rice as the first speaker. He is a professor in philosophy at the Department of Philosophy in Durham University. He is also a co-director of the Center for Hum Humanities Engaging Science and Society. He has published several books and has a very impressive list of publications in both social and medical science. The most recent book is from 2015, and with, for this conference, a very relevant title, Causation, Evidence, and Inference. So please, Julian. Okay. Actually, we're about five minutes early, is that? Well, I don't, yes. I don't, not. Five, minutes. Five, minutes five minutes more, great. Uh, thanks so much for um, coming out this morning. Um, great to see you all back. Um, Thanks also for inviting me here. It's uh, my first time in Oslo, so um, I really appreciate that. Um, and uh, thanks in particular to Pierre for suggesting me um, to talk about, actually, um, about RCTs versus observational studies. This will, I will not, I will look at this topic um, from a rather abstract perspective. So as Pierre told you, I'm a philosopher and we tend to sort of, uh, you know, live in this very abstract space. So I hope, so it's going to be very, very different from um, what you heard yesterday, but I hope nonetheless that um, it's going to be interesting. So in this talk, I'm going to do three things. Um, I will very briefly introduce the standard epistemology um, of contemporary evidence-based medicine um, that, that we find right now sort of in this new movement, perhaps, of evidence, or relatively recent movement um, of evidence-based medicine. Um, but also give it some philosophical underpinnings, a kind of philosophical understanding of what's going on um, in this area. I will then introduce an alternative, the pragmatist theory of evidence, which um, is sort of really my brainchild. And then lastly, um, but most importantly, I will look at Four facts about biomedical research practice concerning the use of RCTs versus observational studies. And I will argue that EBM, the epistemology of EBM, cannot explain these facts, or rather out of the four it can only explain one, whereas the pragmatist theory of evidence can explain all four. So it makes much better sense of um, biomedical research practice. So that's the plan. And so let's start. Um, the epistemological, it's really a paradigm that um, the proponents of evidence-based medicine um, are defending. And I think it consists of two different theses, one of which is really nearly trivial. We all agree on it. It's, it's, it's uncontroversial. But the other one is really very highly controversial. So the uncontroversial one is that treatment decisions should be made on the, base, uh, on the basis of the best available evidence. Well, we all agree on that, right? And um, this is David Sackett, and um, everybody knows this quotation, actually, from, from his paper on evidence-based medicine, so I won't even read it to you. But the idea is just treatment decisions should be based on the best available evidence. But now, the second um, is a... I'm sorry that... <laughs> the, why this happened, sorry. Um, no, I can't show you this. <laughs> I'm so sorry about this. Um, ah. um, the second, the controversial bit, is a definition of what this best evidence actually is. Um, and this is encapsulated in, a para in the hierarchy of evidence, in this pyramid, where um, evidence-based medicine tells you what really high-quality evidence is, versus lower quality, versus lower quality, versus lowest quality. And what you find at the apex um, of this pyramid is um, randomized controlled trials, RCTs, um, or systematic reviews or meta-analyses of the um, results of such um, experiments. And then you get observational studies, cohort studies, case control studies, case series, and so on, lower down, and um, expert opinion, animal research, in vitro research, really at the lowest um, level of that evidence. So it gives you a definition of evidence um, in the form of um, a, an a priori, transcendent, sort of true for all places and times, um, account of what good evidence is. 
Good, ex uh, good evidence is evidence that comes from RCTs. Not so good evidence is evidence that comes from any other kinds of studies, including in vitro research, I guess biobanks, um, you know, all, all kinds of observational studies. Now, philosophically, the EBM epistemology is a version of experimentalism, um, really. And the idea of experimentalism goes back to um, the scientific revolution, really. Um, and I think this comes in two versions. The weaker version just maintains that controlled experiments are a specially credible source of evidence for scientific hypotheses, or more in particular for um, causal claims. So they're intrinsically reliable, they're a special source of evidence. Whereas the strong version maintains that the, the truth of scientific claims can only be known if they have been tested through experiments. And um, in biomedical research, you find, for example, Ronald Fisher, um, uh, Joseph Bergson, or Jacob Yerushalmi as early proponents of the strong version, whereas Austin Bradford Hill um, is a proponent of the weaker version of experimentalism. So saying that, you know, experiments are a especially credible source, but we don't need it, whereas Fisher and others say, in order to know something, we really need, um, we need experiments. Um, Experimentalism has been articulated and defended for a long, long time in philosophy. Um, that goes back to Francis Bacon, for example, to um, John Stuart Mill. Um, Mill's methods, really, are just a formalization of controlled experiments. And so here we have one um, very sophisticated defense of experimentalism um, early in, in philosophy. However, um, so... And as we all know, after the scientific revolution, um, scientific research received an enormous boost and has led to um, countless new discoveries um, and new insights. However, like, for example, the germ theory of disease, there can be ideas that are very fruitful and very powerful at some point and yet be false, right? And so experimentalism um, has also got some um, critique, um, and here are a number of um, criticisms that have been made about evidence-based medicine or about sort of the, 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 the epistemology that puts RCTs, uh, that gives RCTs or regards RCTs as the gold standard of evidence. So here are some examples of um, criticisms that have been made. So whereas ideal RCTs really clinch causal conclusions, Real RCTs, the RCTs that we find, um, you know, actually being conducted um, in clinics, don't guarantee um, causal conclusions um, simply for statistical reasons, um, for example, or because, um, you know, certain um, mechanisms of control that you need cannot perfectly implement it, um, cannot perfectly be implemented. Um, RCTs are costly in at least three senses, financially, ethically, but also epistemologically. Um, thirdly, RCTs address only a narrow range of questions, and there are lots and lots of um, things we would like to know. So RCTs are really good at addressing effectiveness questions. Um, does this treatment work? But there are all sorts of other things um, that we would like to know, um, you know, something about side effects, something about cost benefits, and you know, all these other things RCTs can't really address. Um, and then RCTs tend to be used um, in, a, in a kind of black box fashion. Um, and so as a, as a kind of black box epistemic engine. And they, because you can have your scientific hypothesis, does this treatment work? Implement the RCT that tests it and then get a result out. And so it draws attention away from trying to understand the underlying systems and mechanisms that give rise to the effectiveness of a treatment, but because they draw attention away from trying to understand the mechanisms and, and underlying systems, we have very little information you know, about these, which we need in particular for external validity, which we need in order to apply the findings that we have to um, real populations or export, um, export the findings from the experimental setting to a natural setting. And uh, so that's a problem as well. So here then is an alternative. 
Um, the an alternative to experimentalism has been called the pragmatist approach. Um, and the pragmatist approach essentially says that claims are established by judgments based on diverse bodies of um, evidence using pragmatic criteria. However, unlike experimentalism, the pragmatist approach hasn't been articulated or defended um, very much. And so in recent work, um, I have tried to fill that gap um, and um, address some of, the, um, some of the questions. And so indeed, um, just by stating it this way, so it's an approach that uses judgments, using pragmatic criteria, diverse bodies of evidence, that r really raises more question than it answers. So what is a body of evidence? Um, just how diverse does it have to be? What does it mean for a, diverse, you know, for a body to be diverse? Um, what are these pragmatic criteria that um, we're using um, according to which we're supposed to come to a judgment? And then how are judgments made? And so I have tried in recent work to address all these questions. I don't really have time to um, give you lots of details um, of this theory, but I would like to sketch it sort of in, in its bare bones. And so essentially the um, pragmatist theory of evidence that I would like to offer, that I'm offering here, is um, a version of hypothetical deductivism or the hypothetical deductive theory of evidence and of confirmation. Now, hypothetical deductivism maintains that, you know, in case you, um, um, you, uh, you don't know about this, but it essentially says that evidence for, for a hypothesis consists in all the logical consequences um, of, um, you know, of, those, um, of, of that hypothesis. And um, so you confirm a hypothesis essentially by observing instances of its consequences, right? So all swans are white, and then, you know, a consequence of that is if something's a swan, then it must be white, and you confirm that. Evidence for that is the observation of a white swan, right? However, for at least 30 years now, um, the hypothetical deductive theory has been known to be false, um, to, to, to suffer from major flaws. And so my theory that I offer is essentially hypothetical deductivism, but liberalized sort of with its major flaws um, fixed. And so there are two main differences. One is rather than being deductive, it's inductive through and through. And I will um, tell you a little bit more about that in a minute. It's an inductive theory that doesn't look at the logical consequences um, of a scientific hypothesis, but rather more something like its empirical consequences and the relationship between um, the hypothesis and, um, and the evidence is an inductive one rather than a deductive one. And then the context of an inquiry plays very important roles. So it's a contextualist theory that makes what evidence is and what we need in order to um, have good evidence, have warrant to believe in a hypothesis, a uh, context-dependent matter. And uh, context understood, uh, understand as um, three things. One is background knowledge. One is the purpose and the nature of the inquiry. Why are we testing um, a scientific hypothesis? What are you know, what's, it's, it's, it's a pragmatist theory in that it's action-based. What do we want to do with a hypothesis? Um, and then lastly, prevailing norms. And these norms can be ethical norms, methodological norms, but also conceptual norms. But first and foremost, it's a theory of inferential judgment, a theory of judgment. Now, Standard HD um, has two major shortcomings or two major um, criticisms, two major problems. One is that little, if anything at all, logically follows from a scientific hypothesis. Um, just consider a simple, a sort of a simple murder case. So clearly, if Smith murdered Jones, then finding Jones's fingerprints, sorry, <laughs> uh, Smith's fingerprints on the murder weapon would be evidence um, that Smith actually murdered Jones, right? However, the hypothesis, Smith murdered Jones, does not entail logically anything about the presence of fingerprints. Because there can be all sorts of reasons 
for which um, there are no fingerprints on the murder weapon. Um, he, w he wore gloves, or he wiped it off, or a cat came and licked it off, or it rained, and so they came off. And so nothing, even in the presence of background knowledge, maybe we know that Smith had an aversion to gloves, and he, we know that he didn't wear gloves, but there are many, many reasons for which um, there might not be fingerprints on the murder weapon. And so logically there's nothing entailed um, by the hypothesis that Smith murdered Jones about the presence of fingerprints, and yet fingerprints very obviously are evidence. And then secondly, <coughs> I'm sorry, um, if an observation is evidence for a hypothesis H, it is almost always also evidence for a huge number of alternative hypotheses. And so if you do find Smith's fingerprints on the murder weapon, it might just be because it's his kitchen knife and he uses it in the kitchen, right? And so it's evidence for the original hypothesis of interest, but also for all sorts of alternative hypotheses, right? And um, what do you do with this? So whereas, I mean, while, while we have a confirmation here, we have not just a confirmation of the original claim, but of a range of alternative claims. And so my solution then to the first problem is not to ask what is the logical content of a hypothesis, but rather more what is the empirical content. So rather than asking what are the logical consequences of age, we ask what patterns in the data are we entitled to expect supposing that age is true? So supposing Smith murdered Jones, what are the kinds of observations that, you know, that would be plausible um, to make, that you know, we're entitled to expect to happen, that you know, are possible rather than that have to happen. And then the solution to two to the second problem of alternative hypotheses is that there are two kinds of evidence. First, there's direct evidence, that, is the, that are the empirical consequences of the hypothesis. And then there's also indirect evidence, and that is that are patterns in the data that are incompatible with these alternative hypotheses. So you first ask, what um, are the patterns in the data we're entitled to expect under the supposition of the hypothesis? And then you ask, what are the patterns in the data we're entitled to expect that are incompatible with these alternative hypotheses? So that's essentially it. And now context, um, background information, nature and purpose of the inquiry, normative commitments, helps us to make these ideas a lot more precise. Um, so background knowledge, for example, tells us um, what we're entitled to expect um, under the supposition of a hypothesis. Think of, you know, background knowledge, right? Think of um, causal hypotheses. So um, up until let's say 120 years ago, um, we thought if something was a cause, then it was really a necessary universal condition for its effect, right? So if we had an effect, then um, we would have to find the cause in every instance of that effect. But we have learned, in particular, sort of with, um, at the end of the 19th um, century, the rejection of cost postulates, that causes don't always work in that way, that there may be multiple factors that bring about a disease, right? And so here's a piece of background knowledge that tells us something about evidence. It's not the case that in every instance of the disease, we have to find its cause, right? And so this is a piece of background information that we have that tells us something about the observations we're entitled to make. So. In this way, background knowledge tells us about um, the, the patterns in the data we are, we are entitled to expect under the supposition of a hypothesis. Next, um, background knowledge also tells us about um, alternatives. So, of course, we have, if we find a correlation, we know that, um, so we find a correlation between two factors, X and Y, um, and we know that might be explained by a causal hypothesis, X causes Y. But we also know that it might be explained by reverse causation, Y causes X, or by a common cause, you know, some sort of confounder causes X and Y, or by all sorts of other biases, um, you know, selection bias, experimenters bias, and so on and so forth. So this is again something that background knowledge tells us. Um, 
Norm in particular, normative commitments, cost-benefit um, considerations, tell us something about how deeply we have to probe each piece of evidence um, in order you know, to have warrant in our hypothesis. And it also tells us um, something about the degree of certainty we need in order to regard an alternative as eliminated. Um, okay. And then um, the main body of this talk, really, is um, to make four observations about biomedical research practice and argue that this pragmatist theory of evidence can accommodate them um, a lot better than evidence-based medicine or the theory of evidence-based medicine. And so, whereas EBM or the theory of EBM can explain only one, the pragmatist theory can explain all four. And uh, here are the four observations. If RCTs and observational studies do conflict, then usually the RCT results are given priority, um, or often enough, um, this may happen. Sometimes, however, RCTs can get it wrong, and observational studies can get it right. By and large, the two methods produce concordant results. And lastly, many claims that are very widely accepted and are really entrenched have never been tested experimentally. And these are all, um, I believe, facts about biomedical research practice, but they are very hard to square from the point of view of the experimental paradigm or the theory of evidence-based medicine. So um, what happens when um, RCTs and observational studies conflict, and that's all we know. Um, and here's um, one well-known example, um, vitamin studies. Um, so in observational studies, antioxidant vitamins have been inversely associated with cardiovascular disease, cancer, and all-cause mortality. However, well-conducted randomized controlled trials have shown that supplementation with antioxidants does not protect against these disorders. And so here's something we thought we knew um, from observational studies. However, we tested experimentally, and then immediately the experimental claim is, or the experimental result is, is accepted as the result. Um, and of course, experimentalism, or the theory of evidence-based medicine, says, well, observational evidence is less reliable, RCT results are to be trusted, right? Um, so it's a, it's, a, um, it's a straight consequence from experimentalism. The pragmatic theory regards um, warrant, warrant the degree to which you're entitled to believe a hypothesis, the strength of the strength of trust or reliability of a hypothesis in <clears throat> as proportional to the elimination of alternatives, of confounders. And so you need to look at the entire body of evidence rather than individual studies, which um, may always incur errors. Now RCTs, as everybody knows, unlike observational studies, have the elimination of some alternatives built into the method. And observational studies don't have this built-in justification. Um, it's only a number of alternatives. These are the alternative causal accounts of the correlation that is recorded in an RCT, but at least some alternatives. And so a priori, if we know nothing more about the studies, indeed, one should um, trust RCTs more than observational studies. Um, the built-in justification of, um, of RCTs can most easily be seen um, by considering James Woodward's um, interventionist account of um, causation. This account holds that some variable, say a treatment, um, X, causes Y, some outcome of interest, um, or the probability of Y, if and only if, Y varies, or the probability of Y varies, upon an intervention on X. That's just the definition of causation. But then, um, what is an intervention? An intervention has uh, four properties in, in Woodward's account. One is that the intervention actually has to cause the putative causal variable, so it has to cause the treatment. 
Second, it's what one calls a switch variable. So it causes the treatment, but then it interrupts all the causal relations that have the treatment as an effect. So it's the only, it's not just a cause of the treatment, but it's the only cause of the treatment. Third, if it affects the outcome, it affects the outcome only through the treatment. So there are no other ways through, no other mechanisms through which the intervention causes the outcome. And then lastly, um, the intervention is statistically independent of all the other causes of the outcome. Um, and this is just a sort of graphical representation of you know, the, the causal properties of the intervention. So the intervention here causes the, the treatment of a putative cause. It breaks all causal relations that have the causal relation, sorry, the, the cause, the putative cause, as an effect. So it's the only cause of the treatment. It has no independent effects on the effect on the medical outcome. And it's statistically independent of all other causes. But of course, this is just a ra randomization has just these properties, right? So the randomization causes because you know we determine treatment allocation on the basis of the randomization. So it causes the treatment. Then you know if you have um, sort of perfect compliance. We break all the other causal arrows that go into the treatment. Then by testing you know, in a, in a double-blind study against an alternative treatment, we make sure that the intervention doesn't have independent effects on the outcome. And then lastly, randomization is meant to guarantee, at least in the long run, that the intervention is independent of all other causes of the outcome, right? And so, in using this, like Woodward's interventionist account of causation, you can just see that a randomized controlled trial, you know, Quay being what it is, Quay being designed in this way, has to um, give causally correct results. And so, what I wanted to say here is that <clears throat> an um, RCT has an elimination of alternative accounts built into the ver very methodology. There cannot be a common cause because that's, you know, by design, that is, you know, that is being eliminated. Um, and you can say that for, um, you know, for different, different causal, causal hypotheses, all of which are described in this, um, in this graphic here. And so by design then, randomization ensures that X causes Y, um, you know, if, you know, if it's implemented perfectly, that X causes Y, if and only if, in the experiment, X and Y are correlated. And so, and then observational studies do not have this built-in justification, um, right? So you need additional knowledge in order to have a reason to believe that it identifies a, a causal effect. And that's, that's sort of the, the main difference, that from the point of view of the pragmatic uh, theory, if you know nothing, then indeed, because an RCT has this built-in justification, whereas an observational study, you simply need to know more. You know, have confounders been controlled, essentially. And so if one knows nothing at all, then indeed, from the pragmatic theory, it's, reason it's reasonable to give RCT results higher cre credibility. Sometimes, however, observational studies get it right. Um, so um, the discrepancy between results from RCTs and observational studies about the risks of um, hormone replacement theory is often taken as a moment of glory for RCTs. So some of my colleagues in the philosophy of, um, in the philosophy of science, Deborah Mayo, uses that as an example. Well, look, for years and years we believed you know, in the positive effects of HRT, but then RCTs came and um, overthrew um, that, that knowledge. However, it's possible to actually explain the differences um, between the two kinds of studies. So the harmful effect of um, hormone replacement theory for cardiovascular disease appears immediately after the therapy is started and later wanes. 
And so in observational studies, what happened is that they compared the two groups too late, so when the harmful effects um, have already passed. And so most of the women in the observational studies were past the initial risky window um, when they were compared to, to non-users. On the other hand, for breast cancer, the risk is highest when therapy be begins close to menopause. And therefore, observational studies found that effect, whereas RCTs did not, um, as patients in the trial had on average been in menopause longer um, than in the um, observational studies. And so what you find here is by looking at the patterns, at the temporal patterns of the emergence of the risk, you find that with respect to some questions, the RCTs got it right, but with respect to other, just simply quay the design of the study, the observational studies actually got it right. And so for some risks, observational studies got it right here. And so these results then show that observational, um, the observational randomized discrepancies cannot be automatically attributed to randomization itself. What matters here was the, the temporal pattern. Um, so, but this, just this observation that in some cases observational studies can get it right, conflicts with the theory of EBM and supports the pragmatist theory because it may well be, and you know, I'm gonna say um, about that more, that you eliminate confounders in observational studies just as well as um, an RCT does. And um, similar, I mean, this is just another example. Um, biomarkers are less predictive in um, randomized trials, and this is because of um, spectrum bias, so essentially because of heterogeneity between um, study population and um, the, the general population. And therefore, again, observational studies actually are better here to, to, to um, understand predictiveness of certain biomarkers. By and large, um, RCTs and observational studies actually produce concordant results. Um, and so there have been, um, in, the, in particular in the early 2000s, there have been a number of meta-analyses um, that suggest that res the results from RCTs and observational studies are by and large concordant, especially when we focus on relatively recent observational studies, on high quality um, observational studies. And if there are um, discordant results, then they can often be explained, um, but not by study quality, but by aspects other than the study quality, um, by study design, so for instance, by differences in settings, differences in the population, so spectrum bias, as I mentioned, by differences in the intervention, um, differences um, in the control group, and differences in outcome measures, right? So if we do find differences, then they can be explained by aspects other than um, simple study quality. And uh, so even supposing that RCTs always get it right, and you know, I will argue that there's no reason to do so, this fact is very hard to square with e e EBM. So if both types of study tend to come up with the same um, results, then what would be the point of privileging RCTs, right? Um, so under, you know, under the theory of EBM, you would expect discordant results um, almost all the time, and that observational studies um, get it right only, only by chance. Um, and this issue is particularly pressing in the light of widely recognized drawbacks um, of the RCTs, namely you know, that, for instance, they, they cannot test for all questions. They cannot address all questions. They have a high financial cost and ethical costs, and so on. Um, next, um, many claims have never been tested experimentally. And um, here I want to start with, you know, what is obviously sort of a jocular example, um, and I'm sure you know this study. So, um, parachute used to prevent deaths and major trauma related to gravitational challenge, a systematic review of um, randomized trial results, right? Um, there's never been an RCT to test that claim, but we don't need it, obviously, um, right? And, however, so that's a joke, but there are tons and tons of claims that have never been tested um, experimentally, and yet they um, are um, part of the accepted knowledge of, um, of, of biomedical uh, research. So the relationship between smoking and lung cancer has not been tested until 2005, and, but the claim has been accepted since the mid-1950s. Um, vitamin D deficiency and multiple sclerosis 
um, has never been tested experimentally. S s right? I mean, you cannot control sunlight, right? So, and you don't want to um, hide away people sort of in, in, in dark rooms in order to test that um, hypothesis. Same with aspirin and he headaches and so on. So there are tons and tons of claims that are, um, that are widely accepted and yet ha um, have never been, or have originally not been tested experimentally. And so again, according to a strong version of experimentalism, we simply don't know any of these claims, but that is crazy. Um, and then according to the pragmatist theory, we know claims to the extent that alternative hypotheses have been ruled out. But this can happen with just as much rigor um, as, it, as it happens in an RCT. And so um, here, and this is just a case study I've, I've, been, worked on, um, I've been working on a little bit um, on the smoking and lung cancer. Here are some examples for how to rule out alternatives in a non-experimental setting, how you use pieces of either background knowledge or study results that are not experiments and yet help to rule out alternatives. So um, here are a number of confounders or alternative explanations of the correlation between smoking and lung cancer. So here's the consti constitutional, ex uh, constitutional hypothesis. There's a genetic factor that causes both smoking behavior and, um, and lung cancer. Well, um, some facts about um, you know, about current patterns in the data can explain that. Effect size, for example. So even though in the 1950s back then, it was known that um, cancer had a genetic basis, blood type, which again is genetic, can explain only about 20% of um, cancer risk. However, smoking gives one a particular str strong smoking gives one a 60-fold increase in the risk. And so even though it was known or thought that um, lung cancer had a genetic basis, the constitutional hypothesis could not explain the effect size. And so we needed another explanation for that. Similar with respect to the stopping effect. So if there's a genetic basis, um, that doesn't explain that you know, if you stop smoking, then um, you dramatically decrease um, your chances of lung cancer. Reverse causation, so um, there, this was um, probably meant as a joke by, by Ronald Fisher that it's possible that early stages of cancer actually gives, give you a craving for smoking. However, there was simply no evidence to support that view that um, you know, the cancer that you get at age 50 or later um, um, began at age 16 or 18 when people began smoking. Diagnostic error, that at the time, again, um, was very important because in the 1950s, it was very hard to distinguish between deaths from lung cancer versus deaths from other um, lung-related um, lung um, um, diseases. However, what one found was, what one study found was um, mortality data showed that if the diagnostic error hypothesis was correct, then the diagnostic error among the elderly must be by an order of magnitude greater than among younger people. And this is just not how morticians work, right? And so the diagnostic error hypothesis cannot explain those discrepancies. And similar if you look at um, differences between the sexes. Again, the, the diagnostic error must be a magnitude, um, an order of magnitude greater for men than for women. And this is just not how how morticians work. And then Bergson's paradox is essentially, if you look at a subsample, so um, um, at, at some point, um, all the um, data were drawn from hospitalized patients. But then you are um, in, in a hospital for all sorts of other reasons than for, um, than for lung cancer. And if you look at a subpopulation, then you might find that two independent variables are actually um, correlated if in the general population they're not correlated. And so in, um, in the sort of Basenetz literature, this is called a collider. So if you have a causal structure where this independent cause and this independent cause both cause an effect, in this case being in the hospital, then conditioning on that common effect makes that those two independent variables probabilistically dependent in that, in that subpopulation. 
which is a version of Bergson's paradox. How do you control for that? Well, while early data all came from hospitalized patients, again in the mid-1950s, they had early results from a prospective trial looking at all UK doctors, and you could rule out that particular confounder, right? And so essentially here, going one by one for each um, confounder, you can rule out um, you know, all, all, the different, all the different alternative hypotheses and clinch a conclusion with just as much certainty as the RCT does. Um, now, there's therefore no reason to suppose that RCTs are generally more reliable um, than observational studies. Um, it's true that RCTs, unlike observational studies, have built-in justification, but this justification is at best partial. And um, I want to give a couple, of ex <clears throat> um, a couple of examples. These are all from social science, not from biomedical research. But I think they illustrate very well this idea that, well, look, it's true. The RCT does control for alternative causal hypotheses. And we have seen that, you know, looking at that graph um, from, from Woodward's theory of causation. But there are all sorts of other aspect, aspects of the study design that the RCT doesn't automatically control for, and these examples show just that. Um, so here's a, here's a first example of, um, um, so the hypothesis is, does hiring more police reduce the crime rate? And the problem is that here, very likely you have reverse causation, um, right? Um, that um, more police are hired when the crime rate goes up, right? And how do you control for that? Well, you do that in this case, it's an observational study, but one that mimics a controlled experiment, um, a, a randomized experiment, so you use an instrumental variable that has just the exact same properties as randomization has. So it causes the putative cause, so in this case, hiring police, it causes the effect only through that cause, and it, it, it is uncorrelated with other um, causes. Um, in this case, um, the, the instrumental variable study found that there's a large effect, so a large negative effect, so hiring police is good for reducing the crime rate. Great. Um, however, later, a reanalysis of that study found that the guy who ran the study actually made a mistake in his software. So there was a, there was a problem, there, there was this bug in the software, and when that bug was eliminated, then suddenly you didn't find the correlation anymore, right? And so this shows that even though this, <clears throat> this study was from the point of view of the causal structure, a good experiment, but there was another aspect of, of the study which went wrong, right? And so even though it, 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 it had the right causal properties, something else went wrong. Similarly, um, here in, in another example, this is, um, do increases, small increases in the minimum wage, reduce um, <clears throat> the employment rate, have a negative effect on, on employment? Again, um, here's a natural experiment, so not a controlled one, but you know, a study that has the exact same properties as, as a um, randomized experiment, found that, well, small increases do not have a negative effect, um, small increases in the minimum wage do not have a negative effect on um, the employment rate. However, again, they looked at the case again and changed the database rather than, so in the original studies, there were telephone interviews. Um, so this was the, the, the pool was um, fast food restaurants. And the question was, does the uh, recent increase in the uh, minimum wage rate decrease employment in, um, in fast food restaurants? They made a telephone survey. They called, they called the restaurants and didn't find a negative effect. However, later it was reanalyzed using payroll data instead of that um, um, a survey, telephone survey, and what they found was a considerable negative effect. And so again, causally, experimentally, that was a well-designed study, but you know, it got the outcome measure wrong. Um, and then lastly, um, this is a, these are actual field experiments studying the effect of guaranteeing a minimum income for everybody in the study um, on the divorce rate. And um, again, the, um, the original experimental results showed that there was a high, uh, a strong effect, and so guaranteeing a minimum income 
increases the chances of divorce, and so actually these um, experiments were discontinued. But later they reanalyzed the data, simply used different statistical methods, pooled the data differently, and found no effect. And so again, in all these cases, you see that um, there are aspects of the study that have nothing to do with its experimental nature, but that can go wrong, and therefore you have to control for all these other biases or potential biases as well, and you have to do that in the RCT. And anyway, that's, that's the main point. And so, but the point then is, if we cannot blindly trust RCTs, and of course we, you know, we shouldn't, and who would anyway, we might as well um, propose to assess each study on its own specific merits, just as the pra pragmatist theory of evidence demands we should. Um, and so the pragmatist theory encourages <clears throat> the researcher to look at the entire body of evidence rather than an individual study. I'm done. Um, to assess each study on a case-by-case -case basis. So to look for this particular study, what you know, are the potential confounders in this case and have they been ruled out? Instead of the a hierarchy of evidence, that is true for all places and times. And to integrate evidence through an inferential network um, that in its totality yields a considered judgment about the hypothesis of interest. And then lastly, just to summarize, here are, so on the left here we have the theory of evidence-based medicine and um, the, on the right the pragmatist theory of evidence. So when in doubt, trust in RCTs, I think both can equally explain that. My explanation is slightly longer, but I can also explain that. Sometimes observational evidence trumps RCT evidence. Maybe it's a bit too early to make that joke, but um, RCT and observational evidence tend to agree. And then many deeply entrenched claims haven't been tested experimentally. That's my story. Thank you. <laughs>